Hello, good evening. Uh, nice to be here with you in this lovely city and all these Clojure developers. So, a little bit about intro myself. My name is Wilker. I work at Newbank. Like I said, we are creating financial services for Brazilian people, trying to create good quality ones. And today, I'm going to talk to you about graph APIs in general. Uh, so we all need to access data these days. And as the time goes on, it seems like you, every day we have to need to access more data from more different services. And we have to reconciliate all this data to present user interfaces and for other needs in general. So given that this data is very spread around, there are some problems that I have been facing for quite a while. And I want to tackle those with you today. So, one is data spread. For example, at New Bank, we have more than 100 microservices. So the data is all the way around. So it's kind of hard to get what you want when it's so spread. So we have client UIs. Uh, so your UI is going to need the data and going to need the data in some kind of shape. And you usually don't know that shape in advance. You just start writing stuff, and then somebody says, hey, I need some extra data here. And then you have to pull it out somehow. And if it leaves in a new services, it's kind of a hassle. And uh, because of that, your clients have a lot of code that's dedicated just to fetch this data, orchestrate it, and make it available. So you can display to your UI. So what I want to fulfill by the end of this talk, I hope to get you a sense of an idea on how you could fill an arbitrary client data, data need. So you can pull data from different data sources that are in different shapes, and they're going to end up in the shape you need. And they live in various places, and they are potentially have a legacy implementation. That can be your own REST services, or maybe you have to call some SOAP service or anything else. It doesn't really matter. So to illustrate a practical example with you, I'll get you this page that you might be familiar with, a YouTube video page. And they have some data needs that I can think would, can help us to understand the problems and how we can tackle them. So to render a page like this, we need the video title, we need the video description, we also need the channel title, as the comments for the video, and for each comment, we need the author and also the comment, and we also have a relationship to the next video. So we have here a two-one relationship with channel, two many with comments, two-one self-relationship on the next video. So those are the kinds of things we're going to tackle here. So how we would tackle that with REST, right? And. Uh, don't get hung up by that cute dog. You're not going to have so much rest to do that. So let's see. In the pure rest model, we would do something like, OK, I need to get the video entity, the video resource. So I issue a request to get the video resource. And then you make another request to get information about the channel so you can lose, load the title. Uh, you can issue another request to get the comments out. And if you are really purist, you're going to have to issue one extra request for each channel, because there's a different relationship. And then one more request for the next video and one for the video channel. As you can see, there's a lot going on here, and that's a simple page. But in fact, that's not how people actually do it. So uh, in the case of the YouTube API itself, their, their video entity has so many data, including the channel title, because they don't want you to do this multiple request. So they have to decide ahead of time that, oh, this data is good for you, so I'll pull it in before. But if you want to get some data from the YouTube channel, you don't actually have to read it, but all these bullet points are subgroups of information that you can have available from your video. This is from the YouTube API itself. And can you guess where the video title and the channel title are in these groups? Huh? Topic details. No. Yeah, you might think, but it's actually snippet. <laughs> <laughs> because if you have been using the YouTube API for a while, you know that the basic information is always on snippet. <laughs> but you know, 
when you are doing REST, you are making these crazy decisions all the time. You are deciding what your customer needs, like what are the subgroups of data, why this data should be glued together. And, and uh, those decisions are hurtful because they don't scale. Your needs change, they are very dynamic, and you have this thing that holds you up on this. So GraphQL. <laughs> So there is GraphQL that's coming, it's kind of on the rise, especially the front end stuff, because if you are working from server to server, you can have libraries and stuff, but if you're the client, you have to be doing all of this work all the time. And you have to replicate this work across your mobile application, across your web service, across your web client, and all this stuff. So there are some important features that GraphQL brought to the table. Uh, I'm not listing all features of GraphQL here, just the ones that I think are relevant to our talk. So one is attribute oriented. So instead of uh, REST, uh, claims that we, we work at the level of resources. But as you can see on modern pages, you usually don't have a single resource in the page. You usually have a bunch of resources that are linked in very different ways. So by allowing you to specify the attributes directly, you don't have you don't fall that problem that YouTube API had. Because now my client can specify exactly what he wants, so I don't need to decide the subgroups up front. I let my client decide. Uh, composition in the terms that you can nest structure as infinitely as you need, as your data need. If, if they have enough relationships, you can keep asking for stuff deep and deep. And introspection, as because as your API grows large, it gets harder and harder to know where everything is. And the introspection library allows you to just open a web interface and navigate through all the data. They don't even need to write proper documentation. Just by leveraging the schema, you can probably figure it out by yourself. So, let's see how we, go, we could accomplish the same, solve that same problem using GraphQL. So, to use GraphQL, first you have to define a schema for that GraphQL. So, what the schema could look like for this page, I think something like this. We have a video type that has ID, title, description, has a channel that's a relationship to a channel type, <laughs> has a list of comments, that comment type, and a relationship to the next video. Um, then we go declaring, we have a type for the channel, we have a type for the comment. Okay, now we have the type set, all those boxes well defined. Now we can finally query for it. So the query would look something like this. So you ask, ask for a video, you pass some ID, and then you start asking for the fields. That's the interesting part to the front end people because now they can take this decision and they can change this decision without having to change the server. So you can start asking. So in the case of channel, we see that composition thing. The channel is another type, another <laughs> context of entity. So you join and you ask for everyone from it. Same for comments in the next video. And in the end of the page, you have something like this. And now, in one single batch, you can ask for the entire, uh, entire information required to render this page. This is already way better than what we had before. Because if we want to optimize this, like make it parallel, make other stuff, only the server side has to do this. It's not a concern for our clients anymore. So, we're about closure, right? <laughs> I've been talking about this. I think, I like to think uh, those are great ideas, these ideas of attributes and things, but you can also see what you can do on the closure side and what you can bring from closure to this mix as well. So before we go deep on that, I like to talk about expressivity. And expressivity is that what GraphQL is giving you is a language that you can express things on that. And in closure, can someone remind me if we have something that characteristic where we can list attributes and can make declare joins? And someone there is a closure from the closure people think that has these characteristics. Yeah, yeah the posting taxon datomic. The posting taxon datomic does exactly that. And David Nolan imported that to the library on next that added few things. But if you see it, uh, this is just a generic query. I just can show you side by side what compares GraphQL and doing the query using pure Eden. So we have attributes, we have joins, you see? Like all the good lists, you put stuff before instead of after. 
and you can do so in the end you can you can pretty much express the same thing I'm going to, I'm restricting here to the very basic features but you have the same it's almost the same lines actually <laughs> so the, the good part about Eden is that this is just closure so you can use the whole closure language to manipulate that while in GraphQL you have to rely on other they have to create features like fragments interfaces and many variable bounding because they they can't access that directly they have to create a language and create language features to support that. By using Eden, we can just use all closure. We don't have to care about it. And okay, so our next part, I'd like to talk to you about the value of labels, okay? And that's something that's getting high, increasing in the closure community as we start using more namespaced labels and see the value that they have. And to illustrate, to get to the point why they are valuable, I have a little thought exercise to do with you. Imagine this, this piece of data. Uh, if, you, if you just get that, what you can infer from this information, from that label, the value doesn't really matter here. Just try to think about what can I do with whatever the value is on ID right now? And my answer is that not much because ID is too much of a generic thing. Like there are thousands, maybe millions of different entry points that receive some kind of ID. So it's like trying to shoot everywhere. Like, and you don't know where you can use this because there is no context. What, what's that idea about? I, have, I don't know. And because I don't know, you don't know where you can use it. But what if we change to something like this? And I only added one segment on that namespace, and now I have uh, something that's way more narrow. Not super narrow, but compared to the millions of possibilities, I might have, what, hundreds, maybe thousands of movie APIs across the whole internet that accept some video ID resource. These I brought some, for some open list of video databases, and this is like where you could use that video in. So the point is, you add a segment on your namespace and you narrow its possibilities. Like, you narrow what it is about so you get more meaningful about it. And if you change something like this, now it's very obvious. I can only get this tiny piece of information and I know where I can use it. I know that if I ask YouTube for the value that is there, I hope to get something out of it. So we narrow it down to a single place. And think about that every time you decide to use a short label. Every time you decide to use a short label, you are in that first position, where you need to know what the context of that label is about. So if you don't know that out of band, you are kind of lost. You need to hope that you know what's this. And by, lab, by having these kind of keywords, you don't have to. They are, the information is already there. And you can add specs and other good stuff around so on top of it. So following this idea, that uh, uh, your information have connection and your labels can be meaningful by themselves. Let's do another type uh, small exercise. Let's say you have now this YouTube video ID with that value. Uh, we already shown that because I have this long label, I can know where the information can fit. And that can fit on YouTube. So if I request YouTube for some information with that label, I can get some information like this. And I can also get a channel ID. And you see, we started from the video ID, and because you know that, we expanded to more information, to video title, video duration. But also, the channel ID is part of the video information. And now that I know that, I can also expand to get channel information. Now I can know things about channel title, channel custom URL. And if, in the case that this is not factual, but if they had an association between your channel and your Google user account, I could return a Google account ID, and from there, account ID, I can keep expanding. I can know the account name and other stuff. And, and that's the point about, that's the relevance, I think, about using those big labels. Because then you have context-free information. It doesn't matter when, where I see a channel ID. If I have a channel ID, I should be able to get channel information. And information leads to more information that leads to more information. And that's how the idea of the system works. So after, after all this theory, I'd like to get a little bit more practical with you and see uh, what, what's that like? What, what happens when you get these ideas about long labels and information expansion and try to write an API out of these ideas? 
So to do that, we're going to use a library that I've been writing for quite a while called Python. And what this library really started as me trying to write on next parsers and there's things that keep repeating itself, so I start isolating it in a library. And that was just something that I used to copy and paste from project to project and, and eventually turn into an actual library. So it supports the closure graphs using that EDN syntax and these ideas. And it's made for Omnex and Fulcro. And it enables a simple way to connect this data in that way. I'm going to see a little bit more of it. So time for the demo, that part that the presentation doesn't work, you know. <laughs> so OK. Uh, this is a bit, little bit of code. I'm not going to bore you. Oh, can you read that? I don't, can't read that. Can get more. Let me see if I can change the color set so you can. Maybe the dark is not so good here. Oh. Better? Can you read now? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So. Uh, I'm not going to give you the setup, just the part that are relevant to this attribute connection. So first we have to create an index. An index is going to be a closure map, an atom, because it's going to evolve. Think of it as like the GraphQL schema. But the GraphQL schema is something that you define up front, and then you have to use it. You have to only use what's there. This index is different because it starts as blank, and as you create uh, access points to your resource, it, can, it grows automatically. So we're going to have to start that. We're going to have a dispatch function. This is mostly for support of closure script because closure script can call resolve. So we can have a custom dispatching, so we can create resolvers and give them labels, their identifiers, and you can look them up later. And finally, this is a helper that creates a function that will define new resolvers. The resolvers are like the edges. Uh, you remember I show you like, if I have a YouTube video ID, I can give you the YouTube title and stuff. The resolvers are the guys that know how to do that. Know how to take a, a YouTube user ID and give you their other information. They, they are the edges of the graph. And for our first resolver, we're going to look at this. Okay, so this is our first resolver that does that thing we talked about. Let's break it down piece by piece. So we call the function def resolver. We send it a symbol. Uh, it's preferred to use the back tick, so you send a fully qualified one, so you don't collide with other people's resolvers. And the second part is the information about the resolver, because each resolver has some data attached to it, and this is the data we're going to send. And you say, hey, uh, I'm a resolver and I need a YouTube video ID to do my job. And that's my input, and my output is all those attributes. So if you can give me a YouTube video ID, I can give you those things. And then that information goes into the index, and the index will know how to process it and give you some cool features later. Uh, for the implementation, it's a function, a function that takes two arguments. This the environment contains a bunch of parsing environment information and other stuff. And here is a map that will have the input that you requested for. So if you request a YouTube video ID, you, you expect the YouTube video ID to be present on this map. So you can use that, inform that information to navigate. And the rest is simple, just do an HTTP call. We get, we wrap it, and we do the adapt. This adapt part is important, because remember, this system really relies on having you long, long context-free labels to work. And when you're resting, uh, hitting a REST service like this, you don't get context, uh, contexted information. What you get is something more like, um, something like this. This is the, this is the EDM response that gets from the YouTube for a single one. And the job of the adapt function is convert this to this. So it's all the same information, it's just juggling of attribute names. So we, you get something that was context dependent, and now I get a full, a, a full map of context-free attributes. And then you get the information so you can move on. So let's see that in action, if that works. Okay. So, oh my god, my Chrome script. Okay, cool. Okay, green means good. 
So I can, you remember that, or I just told you about, you need some context information, right? So I need to provide a YouTube video ID somehow. I can do that with a lookup half. They look like lookup halves on Datomic. So I can say, hey, I get you on YouTube video ID. Let me get one here that's valid. So if I just query for this, all that I get is, um, is, a, is a map with the information that I just provided. The interesting part is when you start joining on this. So I create a join here, and then you can see it gave me all the options that I, that I mentioned on my resolver output, because it knows that if you have an ID, I can give you this. So it can give me autocomplete, so I can ask for the video title, I can ask for a channel title, and you get the information. And it's good that Alex mentioned uh, flame graphs because we have one to your query performance as well that just shows up here, so you have an idea where the time's been spent. And that's our first resolver. So the next part is we are going for the, oh, sorry. Now, before we go, I want to explain you a little bit more how, how that process works. Uh, as you saw, when you just provided the ID, what you get is a context like the thing you see on the left. So think like this. This is the context is what information I know right now about the parsing process that I want to do. And when we start, we just have the video ID, and then you start processing the query, and you can see the results below. So the first part of the query asks for a YouTube video ID. So it tries to look it up on the context and it says, okay, sure, I have a video ID. So I can just fill it up for you, no problem. And then it asks for the title. But if, when you ask for the title, there is no title on the context. At this point, it triggers the, it triggers the index and say, hey, how, how can I get a YouTube title? And then it's going to know that that resolver can do that for the YouTube ID. It's going to call that resolver and it's gonna merge the result back on the context. So, I asked for information I didn't have, so I go on the resolver, and the resolver, especially if you're doing REST stuff, is going to return way more things than you need. But it's good that you are already there. So as I ask now, now I have a title, so I can fill up the title, description, and that goes on until you have your result filled out. So anytime you, have, you need something that you don't have already, it should try to look it up, otherwise it gets from the current information. Okay, cool, all right, that's following me still. <laughs> okay, so now for the comments. Uh, how we can implement the comments? Because up to this point, I only show you flat things, like only flat maps, which are better, because they are easy to deal with. I hope you all agree with that. But uh, nesting is necessary, because for example, you can't have multiple comments on the same flat map. You know, each comment has different information and you need to descend a level at this point. To do that, let's see, I want to comment this code. So we have the resolver for the YouTube comments. Let me take soft wrap off. Okay, so very much like the previous one, we require a YouTube ID. That's a requirement to get that the comments. But this time, in our output definition, you see the output definition is actually a query as well. So you can express nested things here. And in this case, we're saying, oh, I'm going to return to you the attribute video comments. And inside of that, you're going to have this information available to you. Right? This is our declaration. And for the implementation, we do pretty much the same thing we did before. We call another endpoint, we get the items, we adapt the comments in the same way we did for the video, and then we throw that vector on that key. So in the end, you're gonna have a map with a single key comments that contains the comments. Let's see if that works. So this is a little hack to update the index, okay? So now if I ask come here, so you see now I have comments here. Because now it's merged. That index is building up the information about your system. It's building up how your attributes relate to each other and what can be reached from each of them. So if I ask for comments here, I can ask for comment, and you see I have a bunch of information. One that might be interesting is that if we look back on the definition, I have no channel title here or anything. But I still have channel title here and many other things. 
And that's because if I have a YouTube video ID, that also means that I can access everything that a YouTube video ID can provide me. So this is very, this expands. As you create more nodes, you have an expansion of how much data you can reach. So I can tag the video title, oh, not the video title, the comment, text, and the channel title maybe. There you have it. And that's how you create nested structures using this system. So for the next part, let's see how we do the next video relationship. Um, this is kind of a special case, because in general, I would recommend you to always merge the data. If there is a 2-1 relationship and they, they don't conflict data, just merge it again. Just keep on the same context, because that will give you extra freedom to your client apps to decide how they want to shape the results. But uh, on this case, we can't do that, because we are relating to the same entity, so their, their attributes are going to collide. So we have to separate that. And to create this, we could just write one extra resolver, like we did before on all these guys, just uh, but one detail. YouTube doesn't give you an API to ask directly for the next video. You have to do it in two steps. The first step is you need to get all the related videos from that video. And from those related videos, you get the first one and you get the next video. So it's two steps. So it's better if we encode our graph in two steps as well. Because by doing so, we leave the doors open to access the middle steps if we want. So the first step is to create a video related. So if I do this, I tell me. It's very much like the comments, crazy, again, all over again. We have a related videos that have this information. The interesting part is how we define the next video now, because next video can depend on the video related. So now, instead of re-implementing how we can get the related videos, I can just say, hey, I depend on the related video. And then this function will receive the related video directly. So all you have to do is extract that. So we put there on a new name, always remember, resol resolvers always return map. That's a requirement thing, because they have to return name and things that can be merged and walk upon as time goes over. And so let's see how that goes. So that tiny hack again. So what's interesting, let me remove those comments. And you see, next video is here already. Because you see, the index can expand information. So the index knows that a video ID can get you related, and it knows that a related can get you a next video. So if you just do that and ask for the title, you can see here. And if you look on below, you know it's called related. It says, hey, I called related. I spent a lot of time here, and I spent a very little time getting the next video from the related. So this can make tractable to you to understand what, what's going on as you are building up this. So now, now some thoughts. When I think on the GraphQL schemas or any type-based system in general, you can think of modeling like this, right? This is our, this is what our modeling looked like when we did on GraphQL. We have these types, they're like these boxes, and we create associations between these boxes. And I think you start getting frustrated when you need relationships to something that are different. I don't know, you need a special comment class and you need a special class of this because you have a, a different subset of required fields. And then you get this explosion of classes and types. They, they grow wildly. What we are doing on, on the Paton approach, I think is more like this. What you're doing instead, we're creating relationships between attributes directly. So you can see here, like, uh, if I, that's the thing. When I ask for next video, it means that I can get you one if I have a related or if I have a video ID. You can always go on the opposite direction of the, of the arrows. Like, if you have this information, you can expand to everything the arrows are pointing to. And if you want some of this information, you can track the arrow down. That's pretty much how the algorithm works internally to give you this information. And one kind of interest that you can actually hedge your data during this approach. For example, let's say we, did, we decided to implement a resolver to get channel information. So we add something like this. 
So there will be a lot more information, but I like to keep it simple. So we add a view count and we also add a title. So if we look at it, to get to a channel title, now I have two paths. I can come from a channel ID or I can come from a video ID. So if YouTube, for some crazy reason, decided that they want, don't want to share the, the channel ID with the video resource anymore, they will cut this link, but our API will still work. Because there, there's still a path that can lead you to the information you want to access. And that's the whole idea. Like, as you imagine that as you create resolvers, you're expanding this graph of possibilities. So let's see how our query would end up now we're using our EDN farm and using all these strategies. So I'll just scroll up quickly. It's pretty much like the GraphQL. And EDN actually put the GraphQL side by side so you can take a look. So to me, they kind of look the same. <laughs> like the same number of elements, it's just the difference we have context-free stuff on the left, and on the right you have to know what, what, you, what you're doing about. And uh, you might think, okay, that's all very cool, but the world is going to use GraphQL. No way the world is going to use this. It's this closure, we are on this edge, so we want to see a lot of APIs going on. So what I'm going to show you real quick, because I think I'm getting out of time, is experimental, so don't consider it as production ready, most of proof of concept. And uh, the idea is that there is a lot of synergy between what we're doing and GraphQL. So if I just load the GitHub schema, this is I'm downloading the GitHub schema from their API, and there is some configuration code, I can share you later, I can share the entire project with you if you wanna look. But there is some code resolved in making the integration. This is all the integration code. And when you do this and come here, so I can now, oops, let me, we scan the index. And now I have the whole GitHub, GitHub GraphQL API available for me here. So if I ask for my viewers, username, so I get my own name because I'm using my own token. But that's the thing, now we are reaching for the GraphQL. We can do stuff like, uh, if I want to have the, oh, you see, now I can ask for a user login. So let's say Hichihiki, and if I want the username, we got Hichihiki from that, that's cool. Okay, now we have kind of, we are integrated this entire GraphQL system on yours, on our own. And what we have now is something like this, right? We have two networks of information that probably don't see each other. But how hard would it be if we want to do this? Oops, sorry, like this. How, how hard is my code if I want to integrate? If Let's say I have a crazy table on my own database that, tells, that goes from YouTube video to the GitHub login of the author of the video. So that would be something like, this, so I have here some relationships, and I have a resolver that takes a YouTube video ID and exports to you this key for closure graph days, and inside of it, I'm gonna have a, a GitHub login. So let's see how that goes. So I start here, and I come from a YouTube, sorry, YouTube video ID like this, and ask for the title. Video title is going to be effective programs. And let's see if I ask for the closure days. Oh, sorry, I have to restart my graph stuff. So if I ask for, oh, did I reload this? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I have closure days, author. And now I can have the username for the author of this presentation. And in the same way I can do, like, uh, forget this one. Understand your focus from Tony K. Yes. Okay, and as you can see, like, all we have to do to connect the graphs was to use the same label for that information. And then we got all the other all things that that label can reach now are on the reach, under the reach of this guy. And I mentioned Fulcro because if you like this idea and you want to create a web interface for this or client apps, Fulcro got you covered on a lot of this. 
Like I've been working with Fulcrum with Tony K, the guy that wrote it. It's a really fantastic library for creating client-side applications based on graph APIs. And, um, and you see, I took this quote out of this, uh, some article on GraphQL stuff, on GraphQL. And you see, like, they, they, they're thinking about merging. They're thinking about data merging. But you see, this is not problematic if involved schemas are entirely dis disjunct. But on the GraphQL way, they're they are not naming spacing stuff. So they're going to have collisions. Very simple. Like, every system wants to have their user type. And they will not jump. But if we, we if we go like we're doing here and have different namespaces, we can merge all of our graphs. No no problem, no conversion needed. You just pointing out what exactly you need. So some conclusions for this. Uh, resolvers with qualified routes provide a general way for joining disparate source of information. Doesn't matter where you're pulling them from. The shape of your data source doesn't have to match the shape of your desired output. If you do it like this, you let the client decide the shape, where, if it's possible. And uh, qualified rules. So my caveat to you is like namespace or information like you do with your code. Because we're so used to namespace or code, but we don't namespace our information. And then we wonder why we can't make the system talk to each other if they are always colliding names all the time. And that's it that I have for today. Thank you. Hey. We have uh, almost seven minutes for oh, we have questions. Seven minutes? Okay. This is your first talk ever at a conference. What is it? The at a conference, yes. I did some internally at Newbank, but yeah, but those are all. <laughs> <laughs> those are good. Just that the those people are, there like you know already. Know, so I mean, huh? that, that's what I mean. Those are the people you know already. Yeah. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so questions. <laughs> Later. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Can you say anything about optimizing GraphQL queries? Uh, you have more a more specific thing because there, there are many of different ways you can optimize. Are thinking about parallelism and these kind of things? Yeah. Well, if if you're gonna do uh, queries like this, it can invoke a lot of API calls. And, yeah. Uh, or if you're doing it against the database, it might create a lot of queries. I was just wondering yeah. how how you would optimize that. You can have some options. I can tell like the the major the major problem right now, performance-wise, is n plus one situations, right? When you have a list, and the list, each item of the list is going to have to do a separated request. If you're using the Atomic, that's not a problem, because you know everything is in memory, so it doesn't matter. But if you're doing other stuff, uh, you can optimize, because you see, you have the full query ahead of time, so you know what they're going to ask. So you could, uh, I have some ideas to fix that generally, and there will be something like, when you're reading one of the list items and you get to a point where you call something, we could look back and see, do I have more items that's gonna need the same resource that I'm going to ask for? And they could accumulate that and do it in one batch and preview everything. So that's one way. We could also introduce parallelism, because right now it's all serial on the way we process this, so it's very one attribute at a time. So this can surely be, be parallelized, and you just get the gains. So yeah, there, and there are many other things you can do, but I hope I can get you some idea. Yes. So in this, in this example, all data is kind of public, everyone can access everything. Um, but suppose you have a situation where, you know, like an order history, only the user itself or an admin can see certain things. Is it, do you have in these uh, resolvers access to, to context so you can sort of check for these sort of things, this, this kind of security? Yeah, you can put this information as part of the environment. So for example, you could know which user they are and which scopes they have. So inside of the resolver, you can make this decision. Like, oh, this guy can access this. If not, you just bail them out. So yeah, they, they, that inf, it's a very powerful map. You can add any information you want there that can review context. For example, at Newbank, we do shard information there. So you ask for a customer, we set the shard, and we propagate that shard information to all the subquery. So everyone knows what shard it should call if the service is a sharded service. And there are many other information you can put there. All right, very interesting, thanks. 
Um, I wonder if it's uh, still useful to retain some uh, structure, like, like with the, this approach when you're uh, trying to uh, add everything to the same context and uh, keep it flat. Like, is it uh, realistically useful to, uh, if if you have like a very nested uh, query yeah. to, to to keep it for semantics? Sake? No, I understand. Like, uh, what you're saying is very true. And there are in EUI, for example, there are some some types of UI that forces you to descend the level, even on full curl or next. And what we do that we have what we call placeholder nodes, <laughs> and it, that's a special namespace that you register. And in any K on that namespace, we're going to descend the level, but it's going to stay with the same context information. So you can reshape the data as you do. That's why I think that's why I say that it's better to merge in because we're giving the option to the user. The user can use as flat or he can nest as much as he wants. He can create deep nesting by using those alias, those placeholders. Thank you. Any more questions? <laughs> the last one. I have one tip for some people ask about SQL. I think there's a library, right? It's called yeah. There's called Walkable. There's a Walkable library that kind of uh, tries to figure that it converts. Uh, it's con it converts that graph stuff on that on SQL, and I think they do optimization to N plus one or N plus one already. So yeah, can use that. Thanks for your memory. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Wilker. Thank it you. Was amazing.